Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. <laughs> My name is Keith McGill, and thank you so much for coming out here to Josephine Sculpture Park to talk about Juneteenth, the celebration we do every year here in Kentucky and in a lot of other places to celebrate the liberation of slaves. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. If you think you might know the answer to that question or might have an opinion on that, raise your hand for me. All right. So first of all, what is Juneteenth? Who think they might know? All right. So tell us your name, big voice. My name is Yolani. Yolani. All right. What is Juneteenth? It's when the slaves were free. Big voice. When the slaves were free. When the slaves were officially free. That's exactly it. And there are celebrations all over the country for that, and we'll talk about the celebrations. But we can't talk about slaves being free unless we talk about how people became slaves in the first place. Does anybody know the first year that the slave trade started, where they actually were on purpose going and getting people and bringing them to America to be slaves? Yes. January 1st? Well, January 1st might have been the date, but anybody know what year? No? 1619 was the year when slavery started and the first people from West Africa were actually taken from their homes, put in a boat, treated like cargo, and were traded for gold or flour or grains. And they were also traded for fabric, for material, and they were brought to the United States and made to work for people. And that continued for lots and lots of years until eventually there were enough generations of people here in the United States to continue uh, slavery without bringing people from another country. So that continued for years, for, for centuries. Eventually, people started to speak up. We can't keep doing this. There were abolitionists, famous abolitionists like Frederick Douglass that you probably heard of who said, we can't continue to do this. But yet it continued until 1860, and things started to change, not necessarily because of this person, but when he got into office, there was about to be a big change. And this person was the president who was elected in 1860. Who can raise your hand and tell me who that was? Yes, tell us your name. Jonathan. Jonathan, and who was president in 1860? Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln became president in 1860, and Abraham Lincoln, all he wanted to do was preserve the Union. That was his whole thing. It's like, I don't want this country to fall apart because it was starting to. Some states had slaves and some states didn't and they were angry at each other. Some states said, we should be able to decide for ourselves whether or not we have slaves. We don't have to ask the federal government if it's okay, right? And other states said, well, we should turn to the president and he should decide. And at that point, every president had slaves. Even Lincoln had a servant. It was one guy, but he was a former slave, and then he eventually ended up working for Lincoln. So slavery, there was never a president that didn't have slaves. So Lincoln said, I do what you want as long as the Union stays together. And then the Southern states said, well, we want to decide what we want to do. And Lincoln said, you can't do that. I'm the government. You can't decide what you want to do. You can't do that. The big moment that everything really started to fall apart was when they enacted the Fugitive Slave Act. And in the Fugitive Slave Act, if you were a slave, they would, and you ran away, they would come and get you wherever you were. Even if you went to a free state, a state that didn't have slavery, like if you went to Michigan or Ohio, Northern Ohio, they could still go all the way up there and bring you back. Well, eventually people say, well, that's not right. You can't do that. Once a person is in a free state, they should be able to be free. If they made it all the way up there, they're free. And the southern state said, no, if somebody leaves and they go up there and you find them and, and I own them, you have to bring them back. And so that was a big turmoil. And that turmoil turned into, Lincoln, you have to do something. And he said, I'm not going to do anything. And so what did the southern states do? What, did anybody know what they did? Did they just go, OK, we give up our slaves? Is that what they did? What did they do? They, yes. They seceded. Look at that $10 word, Jonathan. Can you tell everybody what seceded means? They, they, just left. they left. They said, we are going to form our own country. And they called it the Confederate States of America, right? So they had their own country. They had their own flag. They had their own president. Who can remember or even might know who the president of the Confederacy was? Jefferson Davis was the president of the Confederacy. So they had their own laws, they had their own rules, and of course Lincoln said, well that's fine, you be your own country, right? What do you think he said? 
What do you think he said when they wanted to leave? What did he say? If he wanted to keep the country together, they wanted to leave, what would he say? What would you say? Hmm? No. You cannot leave. You cannot go. Right? And they said, we're leaving. He said, you better get back in here. Like, we are not getting back in there. And they had a big fight. And that big fight became what? What happened in the 1860s where half of the country was fighting with the other half of the country? War. War. Right? The Civil War happened. And it was North against South. And it was brother against brother, because literally some brothers were saying, I'm going up to the Union, I don't believe in this. And some brothers said, well, you know what? I'm going to stay down here in the South, because this is where I grew up. So there was a huge war. It was horrible. It was a horrible war. A lot of people died. A lot of property was destroyed. A lot of people lost loved ones. And so about a year and a half goes by. And finally, there was a guy who said, Lincoln, you could change this if you just would do that. If you would just change this, everything will be fine. All you have to do is abolish slavery, right? And this guy was a journalist, a very important journalist named Horace Greeley. He wrote in 1862 for a newspaper called the Tribune. Now, we are so lucky today, Elohim, because we have with us Horace Greeley. Everybody give a big hand for Horace Greeley. All right. Come on up, Horace. Right? So Horace Greeley, whose actual name is what? Jack. Jack. Horace Greeley, Jack, sure, whatever, came up, came up with a, uh, a solution, and he wrote to Lincoln in the newspaper. Now, Lincoln did not like to, to have people tell him what to do. He was a debater. He was an orator. He was in charge of the country. And so Lincoln wrote back. And again, lucky as we are, I can't even believe this. I can't even believe we were able to do this. We have Abraham Lincoln here with us. Abraham, we'll give a big hand for Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. All right. So Abraham Lincoln, whose actual name is? Joseph. Joseph is going to talk to Horace Greeley, whose actual name is Jack, and they're going to have a little conversation. So, so Horace Greeley, Horace Greeley was a journalist, but he was an old guy, right? So how'd he look, Jack? He's very old. Here we go. So Jack, I'm sorry, <clears throat> Mr. Greeley, you're going to turn to Mr. Lincoln, and you're going to read the letter you wrote to him. <clears throat> Dear President Lincoln, you must know already that a great proportion of those who triumphed in your election and all of those who desire the unqualified suppression of the rebellion are sorely disappointed and deeply pained by the policy you seem to be pursuing with the regard of slaves to the slaves of rebels. Wow, give it up for, for Jack. All right, so now Lincoln is going to do the same thing. He's like, wait a minute, you can't talk to me like that. So you're going to right, think tall because Lincoln was very tall and very loud. Here we go, Mr. Lincoln. Dear Mr. Greeley, my primary object in this struggle is to save the Union, and it is either to save or destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. If I could save it by freeing all slaves, all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving other alone, I would also do that. What do you do? What I do about slavery and the colored race? I do because I believe it helps to save this union. Give it up for Jack and Joseph. Excellent. You gentlemen can have a seat. That was gorgeous. That was so great. So Horace Greeley wrote and said, you have to free the slaves. And Lincoln said, I don't really care about freeing the slaves. I just want to save my union. Right. So then the war continues on. And of course, it gets worse and worse and worse. And we get to the Battle of Antietam. And it's an especially horrible battle for the South. And the South is really weakened. And so then Lincoln says, this is where I can try to save my union. And so what Lincoln does is he drafts a really important paper that was the very first step in freeing all the slaves. Anybody know what the name of that really important paper was? What was the name of that really important paper? Big voice. Proclamation, proclamation. Very close. It was the Emancipation Proclamation. Everybody, Emancipation Proclamation. Nice work. And in the Emancipation Proclamation, he told people, hey, 
I'm gonna free the slaves and this is how I'm gonna do it. Okay, so a year has passed since he's talked to Horace Greeley and people change over time. And so now we have the Lincoln of 1863 who's about to come up and read part of the Emancipation Proclamation. Give our new Lincoln a hand. All right, and our, Lincoln, our new Lincoln's name is? Eva. Eva, everybody say hi, Eva. Hi, Eva. Nice work, people. All right, so I'm gonna give you the floor, Mr. President, and now you're gonna be very presidential and you're gonna read the speech. On the first day of January, in the year of our Lord 1863, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then thenceforward and forever free. Nice work. Eva, you had those big words like heretofore and thenceforward. I don't, I, well, I say it a lot, but a lot of people don't say heretofore, right? I am heretofore hungry, and I would there's, thenceforward like to have a lot of chicken nuggets. Sometimes I say that when I go to McDonald's, but that's just me. I'm just one guy. Right, so Lincoln basically said, all the slaves are free. So what should happen next, anybody? If all the slaves are free, what should happen next? What should be the very next thing that's happened, Joseph? What? End, the war. End of the war, and all the slaves should be... All the slaves should be free, but they were not freed. Why not? Why would people not free the slaves when Lincoln said free? Some people did. Some people freed the slaves and did what they were supposed to. Why would some people not want to free the slaves? Why would you want to keep all the slaves? Yes? Because you didn't like his decision and you liked having someone do stuff for you. Two excellent points. Very good, Kimmel. Two excellent points. You did not like Lincoln. Right? And we know some people didn't like Lincoln. And you wanted people to work for you. You had a big farm. And if you let all the people go, you can't work the farm. And you might lose the farm. Right? So people say, no, we're not letting the slaves go. And here's something very interesting. The Emancipation Proclamation only freed slaves in Confederate states. It only freed those slaves that said, we quit. There were four states that did not join the Confederacy because Lincoln said, look, if you keep your slaves, and don't join the Confederacy, I feel like that's a good deal. Because if you join the Confederacy, there'll be more people against me, and I might lose the war, and I might lose the Union. So you can keep your slaves as long as you don't join the Confederacy. And those four slaves were Kentucky, Delaware, Maryland, and Missouri. So those four states were like, you guys do what you want to. We're not, we're not fighting. They eventually did sort of get into the war, but for the most part, they were like, we can keep our slaves either way, so just let us know how it goes, right? So the war continued and continued and continued until finally the South had been almost destroyed, right? We talk about the burning of Atlanta. We talk about there were so many other cities that were decimated, that were destroyed, and finally the South surrenders. They say, we give up, you win, right? The South surrenders in April 1865, and a lot more slaves were freed, but still, all of the slaves were not freed, right? Some of the people actually, as the war was coming down, decided that they were going to just move. And so people close to Texas, they just moved to Texas. They said, we're just gonna go over to Texas. And then that way, when they come to Mississippi, when they come to Louisiana, they won't find us because we won't be there, right? So. At the end of the war, it was charged to the Union soldiers that they were supposed to go throughout the land and go all the way down and say, you have to let your slaves go. Your slaves are free, you have to let them go. And so finally, the last state they get to is Texas. And there's a man who is the leader of a part of the Union, and his name is Major General George Granger. And Major General George Granger rode a horse because they didn't have tanks and they didn't have jeeps. And so, oh, what, I, right over there, here he comes, General George Granger riding up on horseback. Come on in, General George Granger, right on in. All right, so General George Granger, sir. You're not gonna return my salute? I'm saluting. Thank you, sir. It's all yours. Yeah, tell all these people exactly what they need to do about slaves. People of Texas are informed that in accordance with a proclamation from the executive of the United States, 
all slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves. And the connection heretofore existing between them becomes that between employer and hired labor. The freed men are advised to remain quietly at their present homes and work for wages. Nice work, sir. I get up for Sarat. I mean, General. Give it up for General Granger. That's great. That's great. So, finally, all the slaves are freed. And that date, anybody know what that date is? I'll give you a hint. It sounds a little like Juneteenth if you stretch it out. What day did he come? Yes. June 19th, 1865 is when General Granger galloped in and told everybody they were free. That's where we get the name Juneteenth, right? Even though Juneteenth came, came in as the way to celebrate freedom, people celebrated at all different times. Some people celebrated the very day after, right? Some people celebrated January 1st, 1863, because that's when the second draft of the Emancipation Proclamation was made official. There was actually an original draft that was done in September 22, 1862, but in that draft, it said that the South had to do an unconditional surrender. And then somebody said, Mr. Lee, can I, can I talk to you, President Lee? We're saying, I don't think they're gonna do that. They're already seceded, so they're probably not just gonna give up. He said, fair enough. So he took that part out, rewrote it, and then we had the original Emancipation Proclamation. So some people celebrate Juneteenth on the day they call Emancipation Day or Freedom Day, and they celebrated on September 22nd, 1862. So now, all these slaves have been freed. What do they do next? What do you think a slave could do next? If you were a slave and they just said you were free, what would you do? Who has ideas? Yes, what would you do, Kimmel? I would go to any restaurant that I could go to. Here's the tricky part of that, Kimmel. Even though I, was, I would be a free black man, I still couldn't go to any of the restaurants. Yeah. I know, right? They just said, and he just read the thing that said I'm free, but I'm not completely free. I don't have to work for this guy or this person over here, but I still can't go all those same places, right? So that's unfair, right? And, and, and that sort of happened with people. We'll talk about that in a second. Joseph, what would you do if you're free? I moved to a country where um, that I'm allowed to go to restaurants and get work at, and probably get money and build a house. And so you moved to a place where you could go to a restaurant, you could work, you could get money to build a house. And what part of the country would that probably have been then? In the north. A lot of black people said, I'm going north. I'm out of here. I'll see you. And up they went. Now, some people couldn't afford to go north. Some people didn't go north because they didn't know what they would do, right? What had been people, what had slaves been doing for hundreds of years? What was their main job? What was their main job? Meeting their family that got separated. What's that? Trying to meet their families that got separated. Maybe trying to find their families that got separated. What was their job? What kind of work did they do? Yeah. They were farmers. So if you're a farmer and your father was a farmer and his father was a farmer, that's all you knew how to do. So sometimes you would say, I'm just going to stay and farm. Sometimes they would get a little piece of land and they would farm it and they would just stay where they were. Sometimes they would work for the people who used to own them because according to general order number three, you could actually now work for those people and you would be an employee. Sometimes that worked out, some people, sometimes people were fair and they would say, hey, you can actually work for me and I'll pay you and all of those things and they could keep the farm. Sometimes they would become indentured servants. Now what that means is an indentured servant is a person I'll work for you because now if I'm not a slave anymore, I have to pay for my own clothes, I have to pay for my own house, have to pay for my own food. And so what happens is you pay me. You say, you can have this house and this house costs $400. I'll pay you and you can pay me off in time. You don't have to pay me right away. You have to give me some of your paycheck. But maybe I only pay you enough to get food and clothes and you have a little bit of money left over for the house. So essentially you're still enslaved to me, except they're not calling it that anymore. They changed the name because they give you a little bit of money and they call it indentured servitude. Another thing people did was they became tenant farmers. And what that meant is you can work for me, I don't pay you, but what you can do is you can farm for me, you can take some of what you, what you have and you can use it for yourself or you can sell it. But you have to give me X amount of what you have. Like I get 75% of what you have and you can keep the other 25%. So the harder you work, the more you can have to try to build a life. And some people were able to 
save up enough money so they could get enough money from selling things to get their own farm. So that was a better deal than indentured servitude, but it still wasn't the best deal. So once people were free, they started celebrating their freedom. There was a man, his name was Reverend Jack Yates, and he was in Antioch Baptist Church in Houston, Texas. And he and all his parishioners saved up $1,000 to build a park on some land they bought in Houston, Texas. And that park was called Emancipation Park, and it would be, and still is, a living monument to people being free. Now, unfortunately, kind of like you were talking about, Kimmel, and how you were talking, Joseph, like, you should just be able to go wherever you want to go and do whatever you want to do. Unfortunately, even though black people weren't slaves anymore, they were still thought of as unequal, right? What are some ways for a long time that black people didn't have the same rights as white people? What were some ways? Kimmel? Their skin color. Their skin color, right? That was a reason. But what were some of the things they weren't allowed to do the same as white people because of their skin color? Yes? Be in the same class. They couldn't go to the same school. They couldn't use the same water fountain. Couldn't use the same water fountain. Couldn't go to the same restaurant. Couldn't go to the same restaurant. Couldn't use the same restroom. Yes? Couldn't use the same bathroom, right? And so all those laws were, st isn't that amazing, Joseph, that they would have laws like that? But that was absolutely true. And so that didn't change because black people were free. In fact, it got worse because black people were free because they wanted to make sure that black people knew they weren't equal. So that's where all those laws came from. Jack, you wanted to say? On the white people side, there was like a really nice, clean, I mean, like, I don't know, but it's like super clean and it's all white. And then whenever you look at the other side for black people, it's just like made out of cardboard or something. Right. There would be, there are pictures, there would be a water fountain that like is, is cooled and it's plugged in and you can get cold water. And then there was an old water fountain for black people that just kind of turned the knob and it was about to fall apart, right? What did you want to say? The black people, like on the bus, black people couldn't be in front, only the white people, the black people would be in the back. Right, eventually as we progressed into the, the 20th century and we had motorized vehicles like the bus, black people had to sit in the back of the bus. In Rosa Parks? Yeah, just like Rosa Parks, right? She was one of the first people, and that took, she didn't even do that till 1954. So for many years after slavery, black people were still treated unequally, and it took a long time even for people to start saying, maybe I don't have to be treated like this. But during this time, during the early 19th century, or in 20, the late 19th century and the early 20th century, people were still being mistreated. In fact, there was only one park. The Emancipation Park was the only park for black people in Houston until 1939, where this family named Finnegan built Finnegan Park, so black people would at least have two parks to go to. So as time goes along, black people are freed, and things are getting better, and people are celebrating Juneteenth. So what happens then is that people decide that Juneteenth should not just be something that we celebrate. It should be actually a state holiday that everybody should celebrate it. But it took such a long time for that to happen. It didn't happen until 1980. And I want to see if you can guess what state was the first state to make Juneteenth a state holiday. Now, I'll give you a hint. It was the last state to free the slaves. Who thinks they know what it is? Jonathan. Texas. Texas was the first state. It was kind of like they were saying, we're really sorry that we let all those people in and we didn't free the slaves. We're going to be the first ones to make it a holiday. And that was in 1980. And then other states have joined. Kentucky is one of those states. Almost all the states, plus the District of Columbia, have made Juneteenth a state holiday, except for three states. Three states have not. So I'm going to test your knowledge of geography of the United States. And I'm going to see if you can guess which three states did not make Juneteenth a holiday yet. What do you think? I'll give you a hint. It's not in the South. You would think it would be in the South because they had the slaves originally. But it was not in the South. They're not Southern states. What do you think? Yeah. Where is it? China is another country, and they probably don't celebrate Juneteenth. So we're sticking to the states. We're sticking to the United States, right? What do you think? What do you think? It's a weird. It's weird states. I'll just tell you because it's weird. North Dakota, South Dakota, and Hawaii. I know. Why would Hawaii not want to take a day off? I don't understand. 
but they said, no, we're not ready for it. I think part of that is that people think the 4th of July is enough to celebrate independence, right? It celebrates the independence of the country, and that's a lot of people's argument. We already have a day of independence for the country, and that day is the 4th of July. Now, why do you think that particularly descendants of slaves don't feel like that's enough to celebrate that the 4th of July is a day of independence for those people? Jonathan. They were still slaves. Right. When the 4th of July happened in 1776, the country was separated from England, but the black people in the country of the United States were still enslaved. So we still really weren't free, even though the country was, which is why people feel like we should celebrate a separate day for those people being freed, and which is also why we have months like African American History Month, or Hispanic and Latino History Month, or Women's History Month, or Asian and Pacific Heritage Month. Because there are people who had not been celebrated for the contributions they brought to the United States. And those people, it's not a special holiday, it's an inclusive holiday for those people. It says, you are in this country too, and thank you for what you've done, right? So I have a question I want to ask you. Why do you think it's important that we have talks like this and we talk about Juneteenth and we celebrate June 19th? Why do you think that's important? Kimmel. So we know why it's important. So we know why it's important because of what happened, right? So we know our history. So we go, oh, this is why we need to do this, right? Mm -hmm. Joseph. So we, so we know why we celebrate it? So we know why we celebrate it. If we talk about it, we know why we're here to celebrate it. So we can be grateful for how it changed. So we can be grateful for the change. I love that, Finley. So we can be grateful for the fact that we're not like that anymore. So, so why else should we talk about uh, history? So that, because people who don't learn history is likely to repeat it. Exactly. Exactly. We don't want people to keep doing the same thing over and over and over. All right. Does anybody else have any questions about what I said or anything? That, uh, that wasn't clear. Okay, here's what I want to do. First, I want to give a hand. I want the four people who were special characters to stand up. So go ahead and stand up, Sirad. All right, give them a hand. It was great, very great, it was good. All right, now, guess who else I want to give a hand to? Everybody, clap for yourselves. It was so excellent to see you come, and thank you all so much. And please remember to celebrate everybody. Even if they aren't necessarily part of the culture you come from, celebrate everybody's culture so that everybody can feel appreciated here in our United States of America. Thank you all very, very much for coming today.